It's time for the chip race. What's up, guys? For strategy this week, we are going to take a look at the subject of a famous Doug Polk hand breakdown. It's a key spot from his 2017 one drop victory. It's from the final table of that event. And it's a hand versus this week's strategy guest, none other than WSOB main event champion Martin Jakobsen. Martin, welcome back to the show. Thank you. It's good to be back. Martin, we suggested this hand to you and you said, and I quote, ha ha, I was afraid you were going to pick that one. <laughs> it's probably the most controversial hand I played in my career and I never analysed it publicly. So I'm sure people are eager to hear what I was thinking at the time. Yeah, exactly. It's like one of those that I've kind of avoided over my career. <laughs> <laughs> For good reason. Yeah, you needed five years to pass. <laughs> sort of, yeah. Like uh, today was kind of a, like a revolutionary day where I actually watched a video that Dog made on it. I've avoided it till now. I've obviously gone over the hand and like broken it down many times, mm. but I've never actually had that many discussions or given it too much thought. Well, let's give it some thought now. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, um, it's a nine-handed final table. The payout structure is neither steep nor flat. Ninth gets 312k and first gets just shy of 3.7 million. The average stack is 30 big blinds. The blinds are 120k to 40k with a pretty big 40k ante. Very quickly, actually, Dara, to bring you in, what is the adjustment for a big ante such as this? Yeah, when the ante is bigger, we need to be opening more hands, obviously. That's generally adjustment number one. And therefore, because ranges are wider in general, tree betting frequencies should go up as well. Second adjustment is we should size up slightly. Now, we don't want to size up too much, usually on final tables, particularly when we're opening a very wide range. We don't want to be using a big size. But let's say our normal size on a final table was a min raise. We might go slightly higher than a min raise just so that the big blind isn't getting as good a price to call. Great stuff. Well, back to the hand with 3.705 million chips, roughly 28 big blinds. Martin, you elect to open king of spades, jack of spades in mid position. Some call that the low jack to 525k, 2.2x the big blind. Action folds all the way round to Doug, who defends his big blind with the ace 10 of diamonds. Doug has 5.38 million chips, about 22 bigs. You guys are fourth and fifth in chips, respectively. Elke is miles in front with 91 bigs. Moore and San Martino have 41 and 31 bigs, respectively. Kempe has 20 bigs, while Carmen, Robel and Vulgaris have 16, 11 and 9. Now, all of this is really important because with Elke stack taken out, the average is about 22 big blinds between the rest of you and to say there is ICM pressure would be a massive understatement. You cover Doug but he can severely wound you and put you into last place therefore both pre and post flop I think you're both heavily incentivized to play judiciously. Martin were there any table dynamics which we maybe should be aware of was Elke leaning into everyone with his big lead? Surprisingly, he wasn't. It was sort of the opposite, where he was playing almost tighter than, <laughs> than um, most of the other guys. But in general, everyone was playing pretty conservatively, uh, even though pay jumps are pretty flat, you know, between ninth and eighth, like it's, it's not really a huge difference. But it's just one of those things where I, I feel like almost every final table I've been at, it's been by far the tightest dynamic when there's nine people left. And I think there's just a psychological factor that no one wants to be the first one out. Indeed. Well, Doug's defend seems pretty mandatory, um, but I was wondering actually, and Dara, maybe this one for you, given that both Elke and San Martino are behind Martin, how close is this to not even being worth opening? I think Martin's hand is a mandatory open. It's interesting with ICM, back when this hand was played, the solvers weren't really ICM aware. There were, there were pre-flop solvers, but they were really only good for spots where you're deciding whether to move all in or to call an all in. Now the post-flop solvers can adjust for ICM and then we can use that to inform our pre-flop ranges. We can see which hands make profitable opens because they realize their equity post-flop and which hands don't. And what tends to happen in these spots is that we go on opening all our suited aces. We actually open a lot of suited kings way more than I think humans used to or thought was possible. And then we open most of our broadways and we drop medium suited connectors. Uh, they don't play that well at this stage because of the ICM. And we drop our, our small pairs as well, which play very badly because they don't block three betting ranges. They don't realize equity very well post lop and we're not deep enough to set mine. So yeah, I think Martin's hand is a mandatory open. And in fact, we should be opening weaker suited Kings as well. 
Great stuff. Well, to the flop, the pot is 1.53 million. It comes the King of Diamonds, Four of Diamonds, Two of Spades. Doug checks. Martin, you bet 450k, about 30% of the pot, and Doug calls. In his analysis of the flop, Doug likes a mix of checks and bets from Martin with maybe a preference to betting more often. Would the solver agree with this, Tara? No, actually, the solver doesn't agree. The solver just pure range bets here. Literally every hand that it opens, it bets, and it uses the sizing that Martin used. This is a situation where Martin's range is actually pretty strong because, as we said, he shouldn't be opening a lot of hands that he would open if I say him weren't a thing, but I say him as a thing, so that actually strengthens his range considerably. Doug, on the other hand, he's getting an amazing price on the call, so he should be defending super wide. He should also be three-betting the top of his range, you know, so he shouldn't have aces, kings, ace, king, those types of hands. Well, so far, so good, Martin. Uh, Doug obviously has the nut flush draw here and a lot of equity, no matter what your hand is, frankly. I think this is a spot where a lot of players might look to raise, to shove turn, also happy to raise, call it off. How would you have played his hand? I mean, in- intuitively, I will probably just call because of the ICM factor. But according to the solver, he actually prefers racing small just to sort of target my weaker flush draws that are obligated to call and then comfortably shove the turn and get all my floats and weaker stuff to fold and, and still have plenty of equity when, when called. Absolutely. Well, to that turn, the pot is 2.43 million now. It comes to three of spades. So the board now reads king of diamonds, four of diamonds, two of spades, three of spades. Doug again checks. Martin, you bet an even million, 41% of pot. Doug shoves for 4.64 million. In chip terms, you need about 31% to make the call. But with ICM, that's probably closer to 37, 38% maybe. You ultimately fold. Dara, let's start with Doug's decision to check. While the king four deuce flop is a decent range advantage, I would have thought for the pre-flop aggressor, the fact that Doug called combined with this card on the turn makes me feel like that advantage may have flipped. Should Doug consider leading out here? I think you nailed it there. This is a very bad card for Martin and it's a much better card for Doug's range. If you think back to what I said about the pre-flop ranges, like Martin isn't supposed to be opening pocket threes. The only hand in his range that improves probably is ace three suited and you know that's improved to a not great pair and a not great gut shot. So none of his range really improves whereas a lot of Doug's range improves. And because of that, Doug can certainly consider leading. And when I put this into the solver, the solver did actually lead quite a bit on this card with Doug's range. It led about roughly 20% of the time. And with Doug's specific hand, it actually pure led. It leads 100% of the time. And that's because he's also picked up equity as well. Yeah, there's a great opportunity there for Doug to clear out a lot of your pocket pairs less than a king there that maybe can't really take the heat of this bet. As played, Martin, let's go to your decision to bet the turn. The upside of this bet is that your jack kicker can definitely be beating some hands that call the turn. That means that in position, you get to check back river if you don't improve and bet river if you do. The downside is it opens the door for Doug to shove, putting you in a pretty gross ICM spot. Is that how you weighed it up at the time? Yeah, I mean, I think betting has a lot of merit, especially the, the sizing issues. I'm betting 40% pretty much obligated to continue calling all his kings a lot of his flush draws but it was one of those spots where i don't expect to get bluffed very often given the icm factor of course i have a ton of equity so i wanted to put more money in the pot so i could chub the river if i improve yeah absolutely well dara the solver seemed desperate to get chips in the pot from doug's point of view so it's probably safe to say that it likes doug shove Yeah, it does. In fact, it pure shoves, not just this flush draw, but all its not flush draws. The thing with ICM is it's almost like a game of chicken in the sense that once you get the chips in first, the other player has to fold way more than normal because you alluded to it that Martin needs more equity than the 31% is probably 37, 38%. So therefore, there's a range of hands that have sort of equity between 31 to 37% that if we were playing for pure chip EV would be caused but now have to fold. So therefore, there is an advantage to getting all the chips in first. Often the biggest ICM pressure situations on final tables are when, as in this hand, two medium stacks square off against each other. Well, Martin, as I said, you you do get shoved on. I guess looking at the bad case scenarios, you're 
probably trying to break down his range in this moment. Ace four of spades and ace five of spades are the hand where you're dead uh, versus ace five, five, six or sets you have between 18 and 20%, say, versus two pair combos you have between 25 and 33%. There are also some good case scenarios where a bunch of draws and combo draws give you 65 to 75%. So you sort of have to combinatorically weigh those up. How did you do that in game? In game, once I get shoved on, I'm just trying to count combinations, you know, like what bluffs does he have here? My first instinct is that I'm going to call it off. But then I'm just like, well, let's think about this for a second. And the longer I kept thinking and counting all the combos, I just wasn't coming up with that many. It was also one of those things where I just felt he was super strong for some other like physical reasons. But once I started counting combinations and, and possible bluffs he could have, I really could only come up with like eight combos. And those would be, you know, his ace X of diamonds, you know, exactly what he had. Queen five of diamonds, his eight five of diamonds, and his seven five of diamonds. I'm really struggling to come up with more combinations than that that would play this way. That would, first of all, defend pre under ICM consideration, check call the flop, and then check shove the turn. But on the other hand, I could count a lot of his value combos that would make sense to play this way. Ace five of spades, I'm drawing complete dead. There's four combinations uh, in total of ace five suited. There's 12 combinations of ace five offsuit. There's nine combinations of sets. There's four combos of six five suited. Versus all of those, I have between 0% and 20% equity. So I'm really not doing that well. It's one of those things where if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but I just couldn't find enough equity to justify a call. There's another factor in all of this that I was thinking about when I watched it, which was also that, you know, yes, you're making a a very legitimate point about live reads and and, and how you felt like he was happy enough with his hand, which I guess he was happy in knowing he had a a good bluff candidate, perhaps, and gave off that information. But the other bigger thing is this is a huge final table with a lot of money up top. And when you look at the lineup, there are some fantastic players there. Andrew Robel, Rainer Kempe, Dario Sammartino and Doug, of course. Elke may be playing a little tighter than he should, but there is some value, it's fair to say, still out there. And I thought, well, maybe you would also need a few extra percent because you feel like you have an extra few percent edge against this field. Would that be fair? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there were a few amateurs at the table like Cameron and Harala and Bob and Moore. Moore is pretty good, actually. He's probably the best out of those three. And then Elke, like, sure, he had a massive ship lead, but he was playing extremely tight. And I knew the other guys, the other pros at the table, they respected my game. So I felt like I could get away with quite a lot. And I felt really comfortable at the time. So I just didn't want to take the risk and, and bust because I knew if I call and I'm wrong, sure, I, I have some chips left, but I'm in dead nine and everyone's playing so tight. So I was like, if I call them, I'm wrong here. I lose this pot. I double up Doug and then I'm most likely going to bust ninth. Well, two final questions, and I guess I'll go one to each of you. Dara, maybe you start. What is the big takeaway from this hand in terms of the analysis that Doug did and and what we can sort of pick apart maybe now that we have slightly more sophisticated software to help us with spots like this? Yeah, I think we kind of understand preflop ranges now better, and that's because of the advent of stuff like, well, PO now has a preflop component and Monker Solver as well, and they can adjust for ICM. So Doug in his video, for example, he suggested Martin has all the sets, which he really doesn't. If he's playing proper ICM ranges, he doesn't have the lower sets. He also talks about the possibility of maybe he has 6-5 suited, which again, wouldn't be an open these days. And I think most players would recognize that. The second big takeaway is given that that is the range and it's pretty tight, this is a very good board for us because we started out with a tight range and therefore we you know, we usually have something on this board. We have a lot of pairs, we have a lot of king x, etc. So this is a very good board for us. Therefore, we get to range bet on the flop. Great stuff. So, well, finally to you, Martin, would you play it differently today? <laughs> God, I hope I never find myself in a spot <laughs> like this. Like this is such a unique spot. Like over my career, you know, I've played thousands and thousands of tournaments but i've never found myself in a trickier spot than this to be honest i've been going over this hand like so many times breaking it down and thinking about different aspects and i try not to be too biased and defend my play in any way and i know the solver likes to call but solvers doesn't really take future ev into consideration it's extremely unfortunate to bet here and get shoved on by a bluff when he really only should have eight combinations of bluffs and 35 value combos. 
yeah, at least that's my assumption of the spot. In most circumstances, we bet to turn here, we get called by King X and, you know, we check back the river and then that's it. Like no one ever talks about it. But now it just happened that I was betting the turn, I got bluffed and then folded. And then now here we are. Here, here we are indeed, making you relive through it all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we always use the solvers very heavily on these strategy pieces and, and it's interesting, but... Just because a solver says something, this is something I always say to my students, just because the solver tells us that something is a call doesn't mean it actually was a call because the solver is playing GTO. In this spot, the solver is assuming that Doug is bluffing all the hands that the solver would bluff in this spot. The solver would bluff all of its 5x suited of diamonds. So it has like queen five of diamonds, jack five of diamonds. Yeah, I didn't have the jack five of diamonds. I don't even sure if he's defending that preflop, to be honest. I don't know if uh, he has that many five X of diamonds other than the, the queen five, the eight five and the seven five. Yeah, again, he may not have in practice. Again, these days we have the benefit of the solvers and the solvers tend to defend almost everything suited in these spots just for the board coverage reasons and having enough bluffs in spots like this, etc. But, you know, back in the day, who's to say Doug looks down at jack five of diamonds and decides it's not strong enough to defend. The other interesting point in what Mart said to me was that he got the sense that Doug was strong because he seemed very happy with his hand. When we had Sam Greenwood on, Sam made the point that he always feels good in spots where he knows what to do, where he knows that he's made the right play. And he feels uncomfortable in spots where he's not sure whether he's made the right play or not. And I think that's a distinction between elite level players, say, and less experienced players. Less experienced players often feel tense when they're bluffing and they feel comfortable when they're value betting. A really experienced player can feel perfectly comfortable bluffing because they know that this is an obvious bluff, I have to do it, so I've made the right play. And they could actually feel tense in a value bet spot where they're not sure whether they should be value betting or not. And therefore, they might be giving off discomfort levels. Yeah, that's a good point. And also, it's a lot easier to bluff a spot like this where, you know, worst case, you get called and you still always have 30% equity. It's a lot different if you're bluffing the river with a seven high and you have 0% equity. If you're called, you're out. Yeah, that's a great extra point. Martin, it was a tricky spot. It was fantastic to get your perspective on, I guess, what was one of the most talked about hands of the day. Doug obviously went on to win the one drop and record his biggest career result. You bowed out in sixth place for 640k, a decent enough payday. So we won't feel too sorry for you today. Martin Jakobsen, thank you so much. Thanks a lot, guys. It's been fun. Thanks, Martin.